Everett Woodrow Knowles III was born with two arms on August 8, 1949, and he died 24,518 days later on September 23, 2016, also with two arms, which is completely and totally unremarkable. But for 0.0017% of his life, just over a third of a single day, Everett Knowles did not have a right arm. No one could have predicted what happened on Wednesday, May 23rd, 1962, or that it would change the world. Not Everett Knowles and not his doctors or the global medical community. Nearly 150 years after Mary Shelley told the tale of a mad scientist sewing together body parts with disastrous results, a team at Boston's busiest hospital responded to a freak accident by doing something in real life that had only ever existed in mythology and science fiction. The most important advances spend centuries, even millennia, as impossible fantasies. So the question is, how do you make a miracle? You've got to know the context of this entire incident because the world, well, the West, was worried about the Soviets. The Cuban Missile Crisis would happen five months later. The World Cup in Chile was a week away, the Brazilians would win for the second time, and it was just one day before 40 million television viewers would watch Scott Carpenter, one of the Mercury 7, launch his Aurora 7 into three orbits of Earth, and he only narrowly survived re-entry. In Boston, May is always about the Red Sox. Everett Knowles was a 12-year-old Little League pitcher. He also went by Eddie and his friends called him Red. The Sox were playing the Minnesota Twins that day. It was 73 degrees and sunny and Eddie had to be excited about the emergence of Yaz, the left fielder Carl Yastrzemski in just his second year of what would become a Hall of Fame career. The end of the school year was approaching too, so summer vacation was getting close. If you're a 12-year-old boy in 1962 Boston, May 23rd is pretty much the perfect day. Even if you live in Somerville, which Joan Steen described in the November 1962 issue of Popular Science as a drab industrial suburb. Northeastern Junior High School got out at two and ever did what a lot of kids did. He went down to the Boston and Maine train tracks. Some kids followed the line as part of their walk home, most just hung out and goofed off, and others hitched rides on the moving train cars. It was the 60s, kid could get away with anything as long as they were home for dinner. We don't know the details of what actually happened, even Eddie couldn't remember. He grabbed onto a passing train to hitch a ride home to Dell Street, and the overpass abutments were really narrow so narrow that a kid holding to the side of the train would wily coyote splatter against the stone. What the doctors at Mass General saw was avulsion, the medical term for tearing or ripping as opposed to a clean slice. Everett only vaguely remembered walking away. A foreman at the Handy Cart and Paper Company saw him. Norman Woodside said, The kid came walking up the street. I heard him sobbing, not crying out or anything. So I asked him what happened. He said a car hit him. I guess he was afraid to say he'd been hopping freights. He had his hand turned upside down, so I figured he had a broken arm. He was wearing a sports jacket and a long-sleeved shirt, regular school clothes, and he was pretty dusty. I asked him where he was going, and he said, home. Because when you've just had a train accident that should have killed you on the spot, you just kind of pick yourself up and stroll back to your house. A clerk named Alice Chmielewski jumped in to help. And she said, you couldn't recognize the color of his shirt because it was so covered with blood. His stomach too, where he'd been holding his arm with his left hand. That hand was all crushed and bloody. When Eddie asked her about his arm, she told him it was all right. She put his head in her lap and turned his head so he couldn't see it. But when she tried to apply a tourniquet, she realized that she couldn't. There was a gap between Eddie's shoulder and arm because his arm had been completely ripped off his body and the whole time it had just been floating inside his sleeve. The best Alice could do was apply rags and pressure to the wound, which quite likely saved his life. And it definitely saved his arm because putting a tourniquet on would have almost certainly damaged the tissue beyond the point of no return. 
The call went into emergency services at 2.32 p.m., and by 2.39 p.m., he was at Massachusetts General Hospital. The paper foreman had called ahead to the hospital to let them know a boy was coming in, but they thought they were about to deal with a tough compound fracture. It was not a tough compound fracture. A nurse cut away his sleeve, and that's when they all realized there had been a total amputation. They didn't panic, and they didn't see the situation as hopeless. Joan Steen wrote, The moment they saw the naked limb, they were seized simultaneously with the wild surmise that the arm could be reattached. You'd have thought the same thing if you had been there, said Dr. L. Henry Edmonds Jr. It looked so perfectly good, so alive. The only thing wrong was that it had been cut off. Yeah, it was the only thing wrong, but it was a pretty big thing wrong. And that this scenario presented an opportunity rather than being an obviously irreconcilable disaster was thousands of years in the making. Amputation has always existed because injuries and accidents have always existed, and so has frostbite. A paper that studied 200 instances of 25,000-year-old cave paintings in France and Spain that depict missing fingertips or missing fingers suggested that some amputations were even deliberate following the death of loved ones. Africa, Australia, South Asia, North America. We have global evidence of purposely amputated fingers existing for tens of thousands of years. And that makes sense on the long road to limb reattachment. Fingers aren't connected to major blood flow. The bleeding can stop fairly quickly, and the site for possible infection is small. But the first step to surgical replantation is not to die from the amputation, and before tightly controlled surgical theaters, highly trained doctors, and a deep understanding of both the inner workings of the body and the sanitary practices that preserve it, just plain surviving was not easy to do. Limb reattachment wasn't even on the radar of the world's scientific minds for millennia, and why would it be? You can watch our video on trepanation to understand how primitive the general state of medicine was until fairly recently. The focus was simply on trying to keep the people alive. Hippocrates successfully performed amputations in cases of gangrene by cauterizing the wound or using vascular ligatures to tie off blood vessels, which was pretty sophisticated for 400 BC. And humans do survive a lot of amputations, but well over 2,000 years later, Joseph Stalin's doctors were applying leeches to his head and neck to reduce his blood pressure after a stroke. And yeah, that didn't work. He died two days later. But even the thought of reattaching a thing or attaching one thing to another thing felt like it had to come from some sorcery or mythology rather than real man-made science. The ancient Greeks believed that centaurs with the upper body of a man and the lower body of a horse stemmed from a union between Ixion and Nephili, not surgery. And Ambroise Pear, a battlefield surgeon and amputation expert who served Henry II, Francis II, Charles IX, and Henry III, all the kings of France from 1547 to 1590, wrote of a farmer whose calf was born with a human head and a cow's body which an astronomer attributed to it having been born under the influence of a constellation rather than being the result of the farmer's sin. But none of that even happened. There was never a cow with a baby head. Even if you wanted to try to reassemble or assemble parts of a living thing, think of the process here. You need to study human tissue to understand how it works, and not only is there a short, unpredictable supply of that, but it degrades very quickly. And science takes a lot of time. The inability to preserve tissue for study made scientific progress slow. When Vice Admiral Horatio Nelson was killed at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, his body was preserved in brandy and wine spirits for two months. The average Jack Tar in his navy wasn't getting embalmed at the funeral home for another four generations. So assuming you know what to do on the surgical side, you still need exactly the right situation. 
an unplanned injury has to occur with tissue that can be reconstructed with the surgeon intervening very quickly for the limb's sake and also before the patient bleeds out and dies, and the patient has to be stable enough to prioritize reattachment instead of raw survival. You need the knowledge no one had, the experience no one could get, the facilities that didn't exist, and the luck-reliant totality of circumstances to be perfect. It's virtually impossible. Sewing a formerly living piece back on was regulated to being something of fiction, literally. Limb attachment and assembling and reanimating an entire body from spare parts featured in Mary Shelley's 1818 novel Frankenstein, which focused our vision on the grossly unnatural and its consequences because monsters were something dangerous, something to be feared. But Eddie Knowles wasn't a monster, and the villagers of Boston weren't trying to kill him. They were trying to save him. While transfusing blood, they discovered that his brachial artery had sealed itself off. Eddie had two things going for him. He was lucky, and he was young, and he was still fully conscious. A doctor said he was completely coherent and understanding. You might almost say he was at ease. Dr. Ronald Malt ordered a surgical room to be fully prepared for a possible surgery. First, he needed to see whether the veins and arteries were too damaged to work with. Another doctor packed the arm in a basin of ice to chill it and slow tissue degradation. It was anything but lively. It was cold and blue. They washed it, then flushed the artery of the arm with antibiotics and heparin to prevent clotting. And they breathed a sigh of relief when some of the liquid circulated back, meaning blood flow was possible. A dye was injected into the severed arm to make blood vessels appear dark on x-rays and Eddie was taken in for anesthesia. Mass General's doctors and staff began to assemble as the story made its way through the hospital. Orthopedic surgeons, nurses, orderlies, anyone who thought they'd be useful. And they would need every helping hand they could get. Dr. Malt and Dr. John Herman, the guy who bundled up Eddie's arm in ice and transported it upstairs, agreed that the veins and arteries looked viable on the x-rays. They called Dr. Robert Shaw to help. He was a specialist in blood vessel surgery, and then they got going. There wasn't time to think it over, they just had to do it. It was fight or flight in a 20-foot by 20-foot sterilized room, and that fight would last eight and a half hours. Dr. Shaw started by connecting the brachial veins and artery, restoring circulation had to come first. No circulation, no arm. They had to remove a full inch of bone that was too shattered to repair, and that also meant they could recut each end of the blood vessels cleanly and still have enough room to stitch the circumference of the four millimeter vessels with over 20 stitches made from Dacron a polyester fabric you've probably got clothes made of. By this time, there were 20 people in the operating room and many more in the gallery above looking down, all watching Shaw finish the final stitch. They unclamped the blood vessels and almost immediately, the arm, still blue, white, and cold, a corpse-like extremity, began to warm and turn pink, suffused by the fresh blood pumped in from the boy's heart. The doctors felt for and found a pulse beating. Dr. Malt said, my, it's nice and pink, isn't it? Eddie Knoll's arm was alive again, but it still wasn't part of his body. One of the surgeons described the bone ends as looking as if the arm had been laid on a bar and whacked with a sledge into splintery fragments. The best solution was inserting a six and a quarter inch kuncher nail a steel rod with three clover-like ends to prevent it from rotating. Inserting it without ruining the vessel repairs they just made was its own impossible task. They cut the steel rod to the exact length using a hacksaw and then used a sterile mallet to hammer it deep into the marrow of the stump bone, then pushed on the elbow of the arm to slide the amputated arm up the nail. The surgery looked like it was going to work, but there was one critical question remaining. Would he be able to use this arm and would he ever feel anything? The blood was flowing, the bone was reconnected, but what about the nerves? 
There was just no telling how much damage had been done to any part of Eddie's body, not locally in the arm or in his spine. Painstaking high-risk nerve grafts in his arm and hand wouldn't make any difference if the main nerve problem was elsewhere. So they wrapped up the outer sheaths of three nerve bundles and more Dacron so they could be easily identified in a future surgery. Basically, we'll just deal with the nerves later. And at this point, there was going to be a lot of wait and see. Even debridement couldn't really happen. That's removing dead and damaged tissue. It usually happens before a surgery. But in Eddie's case, they needed to find out which tissues responded to blood flow, and only then they'd know what to remove. But could they also save his mangled hand? They patched up his exposed shoulder and back wounds and switched operating rooms to a new, fresh one to get away from possible contamination from so many hours of so many people in the first theater. And then they used tissue from his right foot to repair the fingers and thumb they described as mangled. Everett was alive. He had his arm back and his vitals were stable. Five days later, the surgeons performed skin grafts over his shoulder wounds. And three weeks later, he went home. The unimaginable feat of reattaching a human arm actually happened. They did eventually do the nerve surgeries because Eddie had no feeling in his arm. It took six and a half hours to rejoin the median, radial, and ulnar nerves, and that's where the popular science coverage ends. It's where almost all of the coverage ended. There were all kinds of stories about the reattachment. The Madison, Wisconsin State Journal touted, Medical Miracle Reimplants Arm. North Carolina's Rocky Mount Evening Telegram told the story of the little boy who refused to lose an arm, saying, his arm rode with him and God. It's a lot like all the stories about Soviet scientists claiming they'd grafted the head of a four-month-old puppy onto a four-year-old dog to create a two-headed canine that had control of both. The news stories tended to be in the curiosity of the thing and not the actual results. Although the Kenosha News did run a story in 1987 titled Limb Reattachment in 25th Anniversary, next to an article about a hair metal band called Screamer. So... What happened to Eddie Knowles? After a tiny wave of newspaper pieces about waiting for tingling as proof of success, the February 1963 issue of Popular Science did contain a single paragraph update to say that Eddie's fingers had, in fact, tingled. In 2015, Somerville native Paul Misano had a weekly column in the Somerville Times, a local independent newspaper. He recalled delivering papers as a kid on Eddie Knowles' Dell Street and how kids would put old spoons on the train tracks to watch them get flattened. Paul dropped in on Eddie near the end of that summer, and he said there were a slew of Get Well Soon cards and gifts from an astronaut and Major League Baseball players. Paul said he saw Eddie playing baseball in a park a few years later and that his right arm was half the size of the left, but functional which makes sense given years of atrophy and limited use. Later on, Eddie was repairing cars, now using both hands. I noticed his determination to use his right hand to start bolts, then finalizing the torque effort with a wrench utilizing the power from his left arm. He concluded, Rumor has him living someplace in eastern Massachusetts on the North Shore. But I know one thing is clear. Wherever Red is, he never, never, gives up. Everett Knowles drove a delivery truck called 200 pounds sides of beef and raced cars. He drove taxis and school vans and was a crossing guard. He spent his life earning a reputation as someone who always lent a hand whether it was doing the heavy lifting while volunteering at a local recycling center or shoveling the snow in the police department parking lot. A fellow volunteer said, he was quite the character. His favorite meal was spaghetti and meatballs and we called him Eddie Spaghetti with the Meatball Eyes. Eddie Knowles died on September 23rd, 2016 at the age of 67, just as he was born, with two arms. If it had rained and Eddie just walks home, humanity's first limb reattachment never happens. If a civil engineer designs wider overpass abutments, Eddie cruises through safely. If he doesn't stumble toward a paper company, he bleeds out before anyone finds him. 
if his good Samaritans didn't take exactly the right first aid measures, he may not have lived at all. If it happens in another Boston neighborhood, further away, Chestnut Hill, Dorchester, Mattapan, do they even take him to Mass General? If Hippocrates and Gallen don't identify the basics of the circulatory system, if a hundred generations of scientists and doctors and quacks don't research and experiment and fail, if a century of peace wipes out advances in battlefield medicine that get applied to civilian emergencies, if sanitation doesn't make major surgeries viable and usher in rapid progress, if DuPont doesn't license polyethylene terephthalate and turn it into Dacron, if a German surgeon doesn't invent a bone nail during World War II, if Eddie's dad doesn't give his consent to anesthesia and surgery, if there isn't a blood vessel specialist on call and dozens of skilled volunteers, if there isn't a Dr. Malt to have the expertise and courage to take the biggest risk of his and a 12-year-old boy's lives, if just one of these puzzle pieces doesn't fit perfectly, then Eddie Spaghetti with the meatball eyes lives his life with one arm. Or he dies on a perfect day at just 12 years old in 1962, never seeing a man walk on the moon or watch the Red Sox break the curse or making his community a better place to live. Scientists call it self-organization. Economists call it spontaneous order. Dr. Malt's single-page report called it suture of right upper extremity. The rest of us call it a miracle. See you in the future.